Okay, I guess we're a go. Hey, thanks a lot for coming. Really appreciate it. Uh, my name is Dan Winters. I head up business development for Amazon Game Services. Um, we are an end-to-end -end solution for game developers. You guys have probably heard about Lumberyard, um, but we have Lumberyard as a piece of what we're doing. I'll talk to you uh, in a little bit about that. Uh, but we also have a full collection of services that include uh, client, cloud, community, and commerce. I'll talk about that in just a second also. Um, and yes, that is me, by the way, at nine years of age. Um, I put it up there for a make sure I stay nice and humble. Um, and you can see how excited I am. Big old smile on my face. I, I loved baseball, and uh, there are only a few things I love as much as baseball, and games happen to be one of them. I've uh, been around the business for a long time, about 25 years. was at Disney and spent a long time with Activision, Electronic Arts, and, and now with Amazon. Um, business has changed quite a bit, obviously. And, uh, but the one thing that's pretty much stayed the same is gamers find a way to get to their games. We're pretty passionate and committed to playing our games, and we find a way to get to them. And, you know, a lot of you guys won't remember this, but I used to go, oh, okay, just a second. I really did used to go. All right, hold on. Hold, please. All right. I used to go to an arcade. That's an old place we used to go. It was dark and not a whole light, not a lot of light. There were pinball machines in there. Little silver balls used to bounce around on the table. Um, you put quarters in these machines. It was pretty incredible. Um, for you guys that don't remember that, you can look at videos on YouTube. Um, I used to hang out in them. It was a pretty cool place, that in the bowling alley. And, uh, you know, if I had to have my mom take me or if we had to go, we found a way. We were committed to getting to our games in some way, Missile Command or Donkey Kong or whatever it was. Um, and then, you know, when, home, when uh, home games came into our world, we stayed pretty committed. And that was pretty much me then, too. You know, Resident Evil and Final Fantasy and staying in the basement with pizza boxes and sodas all around and stay up till 4 o'clock in the morning playing World of Warcraft because I had two more bubbles to complete before I could level up. And then, of course, after I level up, I get all this good stuff and all the cool stuff I got. And now I have to figure out how I'm going to use it. So then it's 3 o'clock in the morning. Before I know it, I'm eight bubbles into 10. I got two more bubbles to go to the next level. It's 4 o'clock in the morning. And uh, the sad part about that is I was a 40-year-old dude. My wife was going, dude, you come to bed and not. So uh, that, wasn't <laughs> that wasn't a great thing, by the way. <laughs> But I liked it. <laughs> really cool for me. Um, and then, obviously, um, you know, games got to be multiplayer driven where we were playing Call of Duty or Halo or all kinds of different kinds of games. We stayed committed. In fact, this dude here, if you can see, has taped himself to the ceiling <laughs> so that the blood rushes down to his hands more effectively so he can play better in his multiplayer session. It doesn't look comfortable, but it's committed, right? I mean, the dude wants to play. He's for real, right? Uh, pretty strong level of commitment. And then obviously, you know, with multiplayer and community and playing World of Warcraft and kind of community-driven games, uh, cosplay got to be a bigger deal. Um, cosplay with us dressing up as a character, as Final Fantasy characters. I, I don't know if you guys went to BlizzCon or anything, any of those events, but I've been to a number of them. And, and the fun of it is we dress up and we kind of, um, identify more closely with the characters we play in our games. Uh, and then, you know, multiplayer became bigger communities. Um, BlizzCon and Call of Duty communities. Now, I, I was at Activision for a long time, and BlizzCon was much different than Call of Duty XP. Uh, BlizzCon was all about community and collaboration and people loving each other and having a great time and traveling all around the world to get together. Uh, Call of Duty XP was people want to freaking kill each other. Uh, Cool, different audience, all good, but just a different kind of community. But communities became a much bigger part of how we experienced our games. And then communities got to be, you know, bigger communities. Esports got to be a big deal. And, and uh, you know, huge amounts of people started watching esports. And with esports, we started needing venues to be able to participate, a network, if you will, to watch esports. And so Twitch comes into our lives. And, uh, and so now you can hang out and you can watch someone playing a game. You can be a part of a larger community. You can you, uh, create user-generated content, put it in there. And I've got some features that I'll talk about in just a little bit about what we're doing on our platform to help 
both influencers, streamers, and broadcasters create bigger communities. But what this also provided was access. Access to all those developers that were our heroes through the years. Now, again, I'll, I'll pull a card out of my old days. Uh, I used to play a lot of adventure games. And there was a guy from Sierra online named Al Lowe, who was genius. Al was awesome. And, uh, and, and in those days, designers had a very direct one-to-one -one communication path to the game player. And so when Al did a game, he was speaking to me. And when I played Laser Shoot Larry, I would sit there and try to figure out the puzzles. I'd talk to Al. Al, what are you doing, man? What am I supposed to do with the prophylactic? What am I supposed to do with it, dude? Come on! And try to figure out the puzzle. And this gives us an ability to actually communicate with our heroes. Uh, those people who before we could only speak to through our computer screen, now we can actually speak to directly. And so we have the opportunity to talk to developers. And I don't know if you know a lot about Amazon, but Amazon um, is all about the customer at the end of the day. And uh, how many Prime members do we have in the audience? Right? I, right? Pretty good customer service. And that's because the company is so dedicated to the long-term loyalty of customers. Uh, we, we use the phrase customer obsession as our number one leadership principle inside the company. And it's real for us. It's we, we, every single day we think about how to make a, an experience better for customers. And so we started talking to developers and we started thinking, okay, we want to build a platform. Let's start with the customer first and work backwards from there. And so we started asking developers what was most meaningful to them. And they told us primarily three things. Speed. Now, I've been a developer, so I guess I'll kind of put myself in the we category. Uh, but we as developers always want to move quickly. We want to iterate fast. We want to be able to fail quickly so that we can pivot and improve our game. Because a lot of it, look, a design document's fantastic. But at the end of the day, it's the feel of what you're doing with your game. It's the iteration and the exploration and the innovation that comes out of actually making that magic happen inside of a game. And I had the fortune to work on a lot of games at, at uh, Activision where you could see the game come together at the very last minute. Um, the, the one that comes to mind mostly is when I was at Warner Brothers with Shadow Mordor. Uh, the month before that game was to release, there's no way any of us would have thought that game was going to make it in time. And I don't know, did anybody play that game, Shadow Mordor? So the Nemesis system, which you guys played it, uh, came online literally in the last two and a half weeks. And it was because we had built an iteration time cycle in place so that we could test, 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 test in cycles 24-7. And so look, developers want to move quickly. And so tools and services to help them do that is really important. Uh, once we complete our game, we want reach. We want to get our game in as many hands as possible. We want as many eyeballs seeing our games as possible. Um, I'll share a little story with you. When I was at Disney a long time ago, we made a Toy Story game. It was just a little simple game that we made around the movie. And I had the fortune to go to Israel right around that time frame. So I was in Israel, and I was not there for business. I was just hanging out. I go to a software store because I can't help it. It's kind of like a toy store for me, candy. And I go into the, to the software store inside Israel in Jerusalem, and on the shelf in Hebrew, is Toy Story. And I went, wow, that's so cool. Us and our little tiny offices in Burbank had helped build this game. And now people around the world in Israel were going to experience it. Reach. We had the opportunity to reach people all over the world. And now with online and Twitch and eSports, and we have a greater ability to reach people all over the world. And we as developers want that because it feeds our ecosystem for the game. And we also get feedback because feedback is more and more important to making games and live services. We get that feedback and we can make changes in our game to improve it. And then lastly, users. We want a whole lot of people and we want a way to monetize in our game. Now, I'm not cynical enough yet. I haven't been around the business long enough to think that's all about money because it's really not. If I'm thinking about building a franchise, I want to find a way to create money so that I can feed it back into my ecosystem so that I can build franchises that last a very long time. It's the health. It's the pipeline health of your game. 
And so if we can find creative ways to understand how to feed an appetite for our audience, we can generate revenue, which then creates a better experience for our audience. That's fantastic. It's all about the customer. It's all about the game player at the end of the day and the communities that we build. And so the last thing, we just explored a little bit off of the, the three things and said, when you're thinking about the future, what do you think are the most important parts of the future? And it kind of, you know, we had different answers. You know, we, they thought that, uh, you know, data was going to be important. Uh, you know, Amazon has a big data collection source that they thought was important. But pretty much mostly everybody agreed that the utilizing of the cloud, the compute and storage of the cloud was going to be a much bigger part of what we did in development, distribution, how we helped our game succeed. Now think about this. In the old days, we had a great idea. We'd go into pre-production and have an idea, and we, it would just be brilliant. It's going to sell a million units. It's gonna, and in those days, a million units was a big deal. Um, 50 million units in today's market. It's going to generate all this revenue. It's going to feed our customers and our, develop, our, our uh, players all over the world. And then we realize that we have to fit it inside this little tiny box. We have to have creativity with a limited palette which is great because it forces us to make really clear decisions around how we make our game. However, a lot of great ideas get left on the cutting room floor because we can't fit it inside a little tiny box. So let's look out in a day, three, four, five years from now, when those great ideas no longer have to be reduced, minimized to fit on a little tiny box. You know why? Because you can use the storage and the compute of the cloud hundreds and thousands of servers around the world to power your game. How cool is that? And you can think of different creative ways to allow that to happen, to feed what you're trying to accomplish with your game. It might be rendering in the cloud. It might be AI in the cloud. It might be distribution in the cloud. It might be that you want to have a distributed development process with people over the world and you can communicate and work together simultaneously in the cloud. It's really powerful, and there will be a day when we can have worlds built that are vast and vibrant with really rich communities, and every single piece of object in that world is an object that can have its own little AI, can be manipulated through user-generated content. So I can come in a world, and I can move this chair. You come in this world, you can move it back with a little FU on it. Uh, when I come back in. That'll teach me, right? We can actually affect the world and we can have a similar mechanic that, that, that uh, um, so many games like World of Warcraft and Minecraft and all these other games have had through the recent years. So we thought, well, that's pretty cool. We love the idea of the cloud. We do pretty well with Amazon Web Services. Why don't we build a platform? And so we started to build a platform for the future. And it sounds cheesy, I apologize for that up front, but we thought of it as the four C's. We thought if you have a very strong client on the very first day of development, you can plan for large communities from the very beginning of everything you're doing. And technology choice is probably one of the first things we decide upon once we have an idea of what we want to try to accomplish. The next C is cloud. So we can utilize the services of the cloud. We can, and, and right now there are about 750 different features from Amazon Web Services that can be utilized inside cloud connectivity. And that's just today. And we continue to add hundreds every single year. But think about creative ways. And, and, and frankly, there are API that you guys can create things to help Amazon Web Services work more effectively. So you can own and operate that part of your game and community. We believe that you know, we took a, a page from the guys at Hi-Res, and we believe that games will require community-driven approaches in everything that we do. That from the very beginning of our game development process, our pre-production phase, we will have to think about how we're going to build and sustain and nurture a community from the very first day. And if we do that, we have these almost like, if you build it, they will come, and then they will modify use generated content, and own and operate that environment. And then last is commerce. Amazon, through Prime and through other mechanics, does pretty well with being able to feed 
customers in having mechanics for how to use big data to understand how to appeal to customers, more directly um, talk to your audience so that user acquisition spend isn't seven, eight, nine dollars for every single user you're trying to get. Um, and you have a more targeted approach. Um, another silly story, I was looking for a watch. Um, lost my watch, bummer. My wife gave it to me, it was pretty disappointing. So I'm going on Amazon.com to find a watch. And uh, found a cool watch. Every time I went online for the next month, what do you think popped up in my little window? Cool watches. <laughs> it knows me. And actually it speaks to me. And, and it's, not, it's not intrusive. It's just it understands where my sensibilities are so it can better cater the experience to my needs. Commerce. So I talked about Lumberyard and the client. So I just want to talk in the pieces a little bit more in detail. So Lumberyard's a AAA engine. Uh, how many people know about Lumberyard at all? Technology, background, and all that? Um, the, uh, the one thing that we haven't done a great job of communicating clearly is that we bought a technology base two years ago that had been pre-existing for a number of years. We took that shard two years ago and we've made it our own. And the company that we bought it from Crytek, I love them, went off on their own path. And they started leaning more into VR and to other initiatives. We have been completely separate from them for the last two years. And we've actually built it so that we can feed the community people for cloud connectivity and Twitch integration and things that we believe are important. And that's what we've been doing for the past two years. And we put a brand new networking layer inside the game. Uh, we've made it more uh, modular so that you can work with different component systems inside the technology platform. Uh, we put Twitch integration in, which I'll talk about in a second. We put AWS integration in, which I'll talk about in a second. We've put more workflow, ease of use functionality inside the IDE so that when you're working inside the technology platform, it is a better experience for you. And so we basically have made a technology platform that's fully integrated with both cloud and community and so we like to think of it as cloud and crowd. Now, when you ask about AAA, what's that mean? Well, performance, so you're running at a good frame rate, um, high fidelity environments where you don't have to bake your lighting into the environment because it can happen in real time. Building big worlds has always been something that's been fantastic about the technology platform. We continue to build on that capability. And as I mentioned, modular. So we recognized very early on that what we acquired was a pretty cumbersome piece of monolithic code base. And so we tried to break it up into modular pieces, a component system, if you will. And, and we also want to think about providing a flexibility for you guys so that you can make Lumberyard yours, sources included. So uh, we want you guys to take the code, customize it for your specific needs, and then own and operate it completely. And we want you guys to do that so you can own your own experience for development. And also so you can create worlds as vibrant as this. Now this was a world that we created in a matter of a few months. I'll show you a video a little bit later that will give you some more detail on it. Um, but you can see the fidelity, the high res uh, nature of the world itself. And you can also create stylized environments like this. And, it kind of brings me back to my Disney days with Aladdin and some of those games that were so beautiful in the old days. Um, and also draw distances are something that we're working very hard to create that are um, a little bit more accessible to us as we're playing through the game. So we're not caught into breaking that immersive quality. Um, VR and, and a lot of these experiences that we're having now, it's about being engaged and immersed inside a world. And so if you have a fog layer, that doesn't look very authentic and realistic, that breaks that sense of immersive quality. So we want you to be able to explore big, vast, vibrant worlds. And also characters, right? So this is Rin. This is a character that we put together in a little short amount of time, month or so. Very high fidelity. Um, and I thought I'd bring her to life a little bit for you. This was just done, uh, it was done last spring when we launched Lumberyard and our platform in February. 
Now, honestly, is that a little bit freaky for you guys? Because when I was doing it and I was sitting, I was just like, don't look at me that way. You all right? I'll, I'll change it really quickly. But uh, and, you know, the, the other part about it is, is that the platforms are a big deal for us. Now, we want to be platform agnostic. Right. So we want to be able to create these beautiful environments, and these beautiful characters and these great experiences for game players, community driven on every single platform that you can. So right now, Lumberyard and our platform is compatible with PC, console, mobile. I'll show you a mobile piece a little bit later and virtual reality. In fact, we had a really cool virtual reality demo at GDC last year that was done in about five weeks with one of our partners, Climax, out of the UK. And uh, they took went from zero to 60 in five weeks and put together a really cool VR demonstration because the tool set was effective for them. Oh, and there's uh, one thing I forgot to mention. It's free. Uh, and actually, it's really, really free. I'm, th there's no licensing fee. There's no back-end fee. There's no seat licenses. There's nothing. It's really free. And so we, again, want to just provide technology platform that helps developers make cool stuff. And we are really not trying to get into the engine business. We are in the business of helping developers because we believe if we help you guys as developers that you will rely more heavily on live, end ser live services and you'll find a way to connect more effectively with Amazon Web Services. That's the end game. So the technology platform free with a great deal of support. And the one thing that isn't clearly identified here is that we take support really seriously. If you think about um, how many, anybody have a Kindle in here? Like an old, like a, a like a, a, the recent Kindle with the Mayday button on it? Have you seen this? This is incredible. So Amazon at one point uh, decided they wanted to cater the Kindle to children and to a more mass market audience. And so what they did is they thought, you know what, when you're not sure what to do on your on your tablet, how are you going to provide a great customer experience, great support? And they thought, you know what, how about if you got to talk to somebody live? And so the Kindle has a Mayday button on it. It's incredible. You hit a button and a little face pops up, a live person that helps you with whatever challenge you're having on your pad. And, and I guarantee that's not a profit-making opportunity for the company. <laughs> but the company cares more about customers long-term and is willing to do those types of things. And so support's very, very important for us. So we have a number of layers of support for developers, a number of layers of support for game players at the end of it. And, uh, and we're continuing to build a, a very robust um, environment for that. So it's pretty simple for us. We're 100% committed to a few things, right? Best in class tools and services to help you with speed. Highest quality games quicker and easier. We wanna do the heavy lifting for you guys, basically. So instead of you guys spending a lot of time building infrastructure and operating in what we call the undifferentiated muck of your game, we'll do that for you. So you can work on more important parts of your product, the innovation, the quality, ways to make your game succeed. And that way, you can focus on the more fun parts of what it is to develop a game and really do what you guys do best, which is to make great stuff. And we're going to do that by helping you guys utilize more effectively compute and storage of the cloud. Now, Amazon Web Services, as I mentioned before, has a number of different services um, that allow you to connect. It's got database, it's got Redshift, it's got all these different things that help you interact with Amazon Web Services more effectively. In fact, historically, if you had a game, you had to write your own C++ uh, SDK to connect into Amazon Web Services. We've already done that for you, so that's no longer necessary. Um, and we've also recognized that making games is hard, but making multiplayer games even more difficult. And, and look, I saw a, a stat recently, something like 85% of the revenue generated last year came from multiplayer component type of games in some way, meaning that pretty much if you're looking at a way to extend the life cycle of your game, that you're trying to find a way to make multiplayer and or live services a bigger part of the experience. You know, I spent a long time at Activision, and Activision obviously with Call of Duty, uh, did two things with Call of Duty multiplayer functionality. First, they created deeper engagement and longer commitment from game players. 
And as a byproduct, and I honestly don't know if this was a strategy or not, it just happened, you keep your game out of the used bins longer because you can't sell your game back if you still want to play multiplayer. And so what happens is your price point for your game at retail stays high. Because the only thing that drags down your price point at retail, one of the only things, is either uh, d um, uh, decay of, of your um, experience or the interest in your game, or that they can buy your game less expensively through the used bins. And so, again, I don't know if there's a strategy or not, but it works really well. And so we are always trying to find a way, even through single-player action, third-person action games, find a way to extend the experience. Assassin's Creed did a really cool job of you know, having a companion app and strong DLC to keep you engaged inside the game longer so that those discs didn't go back to retail. And so we recognize that making multiplayer games is hard. And so we want to try and make it easier for developers. So we created something called GameLift. GameLift is a back-end server-side deployment for your multiplayer game into the cloud. So instead of you having to hire two or three network engineers to build this infrastructure and then to spend weeks and months trying to get to work, and then you have a great multiplayer idea that all of a sudden you get six months of development, you go, God, I can't make it work, so I'm going back to my single-player game, which is a shame, right? We built the infrastructure for you. So now you just pretty much you take your binary, you deploy it in the cloud, like takes five minutes to deploy your stuff in the cloud and people are experiencing and playing your multiplayer session based game immediately. But the magic to this, that's cool, it's fine, you know, it saves me some time. The magic to this is the auto scaling functionality. So when we're trying to forecast servers, it's similar to how we used to try to forecast units coming out of Japan when we were looking at console games. The cartridges took 90 days to come over and get into distribution. So we had used to try to guess how many units we thought we were going to sell of a game. Mario 64, well, not, not a great example because they're going to sell a gazillion of those. But, um, you know, Mario 64, if they think they're going to sell 5 million units, they have to write a check to Nintendo at that time for $10 a unit, or, and it's a lot of hundreds of millions of dollars. A um, better example would be if you're going to make a Call of Duty game on the console or if you're going to make Bugs Life on the N64 or the PlayStation 2. All those things had to take time to come back over, so you had to forecast. Well, same thing for servers. You have to try and figure out how many players you're going to have inside your game, and you forecast. And sometimes you forecast too high, which means you're paying for servers you're not using. Or a worse scenario is you're underestimating and you're not able to support the customers coming into your game. And so we have an auto scaling function for game lift, which means that you can take a base case amount of reserved instances or servers, and then from there you can set in parameters inside a dashboard that says, if I get 10 more users coming into my game, start up another server. Or if I've already built in that capacity and I, and I get a time frame where there's not a lot of people in there, it'll spin it down. So it auto scales for your game so you're only using exactly what you need. Another one of the services that we have is something called Cloud Canvas. Now Cloud Canvas is just a, a tool to help you make things a little bit easier inside the game development process. Um, we have something called Flowgraph. And Flowgraph is a little bit like Blueprint from Unreal. It allows you to click and drag from a primitive from Amazon Web Services down inside to your, S, to your uh, SDK, which means that you don't have to spend two or three weeks stitching something up through an API to make something work with an Amazon Web Services primitive. You just click it and drag it and it works right away. So you can focus more of your time on leaderboards or other gifting systems or some other features that help your game be more successful and more fun for your game player. Now, we wanted to show really just how easy this is and so I called one of the guys, I was actually in Korea a few months ago, and I said, hey, can you put something together really quickly? And is, anybody have an echo in here? You know what Alexa is? Voice recognition software, right? So now you have one? You didn't have it a second ago? <laughs> I, I just sold one? Wait, I just sold one, excellent, I get a credit for that. Um, so uh, if, if you haven't seen it, they're really cool, by the way. 
they just sit inside your your. I have mine in my kitchen, and you talk to it. And it's voice recognition, and you play music. And if you're a Prime member, you get free music, and you get all kinds of free information on it. Um, anyways, it has APIs and skills um, that are available for you as developers to interact with Alexa as the voice recognition software. And it's going to be a a big primary area of focus for the company coming up very soon. And so I called a guy back, a dev, one of our guys back in Seattle, and said, how can you stitch up something for Alexa? And so he wrote a little scripting thing, took him a couple of hours. And uh, let me see if you guys, I don't know if you'd be able to hear this, but uh, this is what he put together. My name is Rick. Is being dynamically generated by the Ivona service. The generated audio contains a data track that allows Lumberyard to sync my mouth and face animations with the phonemes of my speech. So, pretty simple little thing. Took him about a couple of hours just to write the script, connect the API, stitch it up through uh, Cloud Canvas. Um, but this kind of sparked an idea. This is kind of the example of you move quickly and all of a sudden ideas pop into your brain. So when I was at Disney, I used to love making games where you could break the fourth wall. I love the interaction of looking inside the screen and having a little dude look up at you and go, hey, or something. And I got that because my daughter, little, little thing, went to Disneyland. And at one point, Minnie Mouse locked in on my daughter. And Minnie Mouse comes up to my daughter and recognizes her. And my daughter looked up and was like, oh my gosh, it's Minnie Mouse. She's a star. She recognizes me. And it was so powerful, so very powerful to be recognized. It's one of the things I think that draws us into celebrity is because for that little short moment, that celebrity or that star or that hero recognizes us. So why not do that through the screen? Really cool. And so think about this. There's a day when you can actually very quickly interact with a customer with a, with a character inside your game through voice recognition, and the character understands what you're saying because there's a parser, and so you no longer have to pre-record all that stuff. It happens automatically. Again, just one of those little quick little iteration things. And I talked about reach before. Uh, Twitch has reach, right? So I know you guys are pretty familiar with Twitch. Uh, I just spent the day over at uh, High Res yesterday where they've got an incredible setup for Smite and Paladins, and it's a pretty incredible, awesome uh, setup that they have going. Uh, 100 million uniquely month of act monthly active users. Now, there, when I wrote this, there were about 1.7 million broadcasters, streamers, and influencers. I guarantee there's probably close to 2 million now. 106 million minutes watched. So a whole lot of people are coming to this world and they are experiencing either the entertainment of a broadcaster or they want to find a way to play a game they don't have to go through the frustration of. Uh, Bloodborne, great example, right? Dark Souls 3, great example. Um, I played Bloodborne. I got through the first level. I want to freaking kill myself. And, uh, and I'm a gamer. I mean, I play everything. So I was thinking, you know, it hit my ego a little bit. I'm like, man, I'm getting hammered here. So I went on Twitch watch somebody play Bloodborne for a while. Oh, now I got it. So it was educational for me, entertaining at the same time. So Twitch has the ability for you to reach millions of people around the world, and it's all through the influencer or the broadcaster. So through Lumberyard and through our platform, we've built some tools to help broadcasters build bigger communities. And we believe that it becomes kind of a loop, a flywheel, if you will. The game... Dev development environment feeds the broadcaster who then uses a customized approach whether it be overlays or customized things inside the way that they're broadcasting the game create a bigger audience audience comes back into the game and you have your flywheel and broadcasters uh, there was an announcement a couple of weeks uh, about a week ago at twitchcon uh, about twitch prime have you guys ever did you guys see that it's fantastic. So if you're a Prime member, you get it automatically. If you're not, you can subscribe through Twitch Prime. And I'm not trying to sell you Twitch Prime. I'm just saying that the idea is how can you feed influencers and broadcasters so that they can build big communities to feed your game. Um, Death by Day, uh, Dead by Daylight. Anybody play that? Dead by Daylight, really cool game. A little bit like Evolve. 
and you go into the game and you play this multiplayer experience. Now, what they did is they got a dude named Lyric to play the game. He's a broadcaster. And so Lyric got a couple of his other broadcaster friends who brought a network effect into the game. Before you know it, they're number five on Twitch. With a game that's, it's okay. I know those guys are great. It's okay. It's not great. What made it great was the community that came together to play and experience. And it's basically a game where you're chasing after a murderer through the woods and a murderer then turns and chases after you. <laughs> it's really simple. It's like zombies, simple. Um, so, but the key to that was a broadcaster incorporating into Twitch. So we put two features in. We actually have a new one called MetaStream, which uh, um, I'll talk about in just a second. But chat play, which is obviously Twitch for Pokemon. You can crowdsource a way to play the game. So Dark Souls 3 did the exact same thing recently and it finished the game in a matter of hours. Whereas before, if you're all by yourself, pretty hard to do. And they did the same thing with Pokemon a few years ago. Sorry for the graphic. It was kind of a retro thing I thought I'd throw up there for you guys. Um, and then also Twitch join in. Twitch join in is a little bit different in that Twitch join in, if I'm subscribing to a broadcaster and a broadcaster recognizes me, hey, Danny D, hey, welcome to the world. And uh, by the way, do you want to play? And if I do, join in, I hit, I can go and I can play in co-op and or collaboration with the broadcaster in real time. So again, we become a bigger part of that community. And MetaStream is a social graph so that you can create your own data layout for your customers. And then obviously a third plank is monetization and users. And we believe that first of all, by you not having to spend money on a development engine, that you can redeploy that money into more creative pursuits. Again, we build the infrastructure, you guys work on the game. And obviously Amazon.com is a pretty effective tool where big data allows us to understand where people are going and how to meet them there before they're even there. Um, a friend of mine at Turtle Rock, I uh, was asking him, I said, you know, what's the most important thing for you guys as you're looking at Amazon? They said, you know, your big data allocation is fantastic because you know what someone's going to do before they do it. So you can better target what they're doing. We can actually build game design mechanics and DLC into our games to help feed a con uh, consumer, an audience, a game player, based on the information we're getting on a daily basis. So pretty powerful. And then obviously there's something called Merch by Amazon. You know, yesterday I was able to sit down and see uh, some pitches, really terrific pitches, really good passion and creative ideas. And uh, what was really compelling for me was when there was a thought around consumer products and the overall package available. And what we found at Amazon is that if you have an app on the App Store and you sell it for 99 cents or if it's free, and if you offer it for $8.99 for an $8 t-shirt, which is already what you're going to pay for the $8 t-shirt anyway, that the numbers fly up. It's like incredible amount of increased interest because the package feels like it's a higher value proposition. And so what we did is we used our fulfillment center inside all of Amazon's network. And right now you can go online and you can design your own t-shirt. You hit a button, it goes to fulfillment center. We print them at the fulfillment center and you can send it out to whoever you want for your customer. So it's a combination piece. And there will be a day when inside our development environment, you'll be able to make a 3D character, hit a little button that sends to our 3D printers in real time through the cloud online. It'll print through our fulfillment centers and be distributed out. So think of your studio being able to see the iterations of a character from beginning to end in toy format. Really cool. So. That's another way that we feel like we can add some value. Um, and we just recently did an announcement of our first proof point. Uh, we've got a number of developers working with our platform. Uh, Breakaway is a game that was made internally and incorporates all the pieces, Lumberyard, Cloud, uh, Community, it's all community driven, uh, and also Commerce. And with very, very deep Twitch integration driven towards broadcasters. And we announced it last week at uh, TwitchCon. We had some very high level uh, broadcasters that came and played in real time for the audience. It was really cool. It's a little bit like a capture the flag with big mythological characters. Um, really cool. There are videos on YouTube. You can take a look at it. Um, but it's a good example of how the package all fits together. And so, you know, 
we have a mission. Missions are good, I guess. And it's pretty simple, right? We just want to help you make great stuff. Um, you know, as I mentioned, Amazon always obsesses over how we can help a customer have a better experience. So we spend every day thinking about how we can improve your experience working with Amazon. Um, Amazon's a long-term committed company. Always think about long-term. Um, if you look at the financials, uh, Amazon doesn't chase a quarterly number. They're always thinking about long-term value and uh, proposition for the customer. Um, it's really simple for us, though. We also just want to be a one-stop shop for anything that you want to know about games or game development. And at some point, we hope there's a day, we believe there will be a day, when we'll have a destination where all of us will go, you know what, I want to go find out how to do a migration from Maya. And we go, you know, you got to go to the, game, the Amazon Game Dev site, and that'll tell you how to do it. And there's tutorials there, and there's information there, and there's documentation, and there's series of information available to you. Um, there will be a day, we hope, where this will be the destination you go to. Um, and it's very simple for us. We're just getting started right now. And so we're inviting all of you guys to help us shape what we believe is the future. Thank you very much. I have uh, one thing I want to show you, just if we have a minute, and then I'll be happy to answer questions. This is a little um, promo piece that we put together for, these are just for show, these, I don't need these, just make you look smarter. That's mobile. Those are real time, by the way. Those are not pre-rendered. That's our VR experience. There you go. Can I answer any questions for anyone? Yeah. For what? Uh, hmm. You mean like Perforce and all that? Yes, it, it's connected. We, we use Perforce. Um, and uh, we've had a couple developers ask us for other solutions, and we find a way to stitch it up for them. What's your implementation of that for Quiet? So it's all dependent on the game. I see that the, the licensing service is all free. So on the back end side, is it just going through the normal AWS services to set up a, a Perforce server or something like that? Oh, no, no we, uh, we have a different support mech. So that's a good question. Thanks for asking that. The uh, support mechanisms that we have, we do lean in AWS support. 
uh, because they've got this huge network of people, but it's basically call centers and they have a ceiling that's pretty low as to how they can answer a game development question. And so we have additional layers. Um, we have solution architects in the front end. So if you're interested in looking at this and you want to download it, by the way, you can download it off of our website um, at uh, aws.amazon backslash gamedev.com. Um, and it's all there. Um, if you have any challenges at all, send me an email at dwinters at amazon.com. Um, I'm happy to put uh, a solution architect in touch with you. So to answer your question directly, Solution Architects are there for your first layer of support um, before you launch your game. After you launch your game, we have field engineers and technical artists to help you with whatever you need for your game development process, um, including per force setup and everything else. And then we have our devs. And our devs, you know, we, we try to reserve that for the last uh, ditch effort, I guess, um, because they have a lot of stuff to do on the roadmap, but they're also available to you as well. Okay, so yeah, let me know if you need some help. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. How interested is the uh, your game engineers, or I guess uh, Amazon in general, um, how interested are they in providing better optimization techniques in the engine than existed, and I guess the sharp uh, just routing the run data to the engine? You mean workflows? No, optimization as far as like stopping for loading times of day. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a great question. I'm laughing because we actually have a dedicated group of people in San Diego working on rendering to address that very thing. They've been doing it for a year and a half, and it's an ongoing process. So um, w we have our platform available for mobile now, 5S and or a Shield on the tablet, and we're working on getting it available for lower-end devices as well. Um, we're a little bit on the fence, to be honest. I'd love to hear what you guys think about it. You know, the mobile devices are kind of accelerating a point where we're wondering how far down we need to go um, before the rise of power on the mobile device actually hits us in the head. <laughs> and so that's the only thing that is of debate right now. Um, we've heard from a lot of customers, especially in Asia, uh, that um, they want lower end device support. So we're very serious about it. We have a whole team dedicated to it. Yeah, we recognize that as a, yeah, look, if you had a huge, great, big horse of machine on the PC in the old days for what they had before, man, it was beautiful. If you get your hands around, it was awesome. And so it did some things really, really well. And, uh, but you know, they were making games for crisis, things that were pretty much internal. Um, yeah. Yep. Yep. That's so we've heard that a lot actually, and and uh, that's in our roadmap right now. I don't know exactly where it is, but it's in there. Yeah. So if you want, if you want, you have questions about it later on, let me know. Okay. Sure. It is. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you can you can craft a baked in lighting if you really want to. It's just it's not as simple as Blueprint and what Unreal does. You know, they do a great job and. And, uh, oh, and by the way, I, sh I should mention that uh, GameLift initially came out only compatible with Lumberyard as the multiplayer deployment capability. And we have made it available for any platform, any technology platform. So uh, Proletariat um, from Boston just released a game called Streamline uh, using GameLift to deploy you know, the, their multiplayer session-based stuff. And it's an Unreal game. And uh, we have three other games in development for Unity, um, if you guys are Unity developers for GameLift. There is, yeah. Um, and there's a, a separate, if you go to the game dev website, there's a separate location for game, uh, I'm sorry, game dev. There's a separate location for game lift. Um, and uh, you find that link, you download the SDK, and then there's a separate API for Unity and also for Unreal. And it takes a little bit of lifting from our side right now because we're not quite finished with the full implementation. Um, but we've been able to do it in two days. It's pretty simple, straightforward makes a big difference you know, the proletariat guys were able to save a lot of money because they weren't burning up money and you know on on the unpredictability of what they're doing with their servers yeah 
Yeah. Do you guys still have that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, Flowgraph is just an additional tool. It's still C++, still has Lua, you know, still has all the goodies. You can still do some pretty good stuff with it. Oh, yeah. Uh, so uh, Linux support, yes, we just actually, for Gameless specifically, we just got Linux support, which was a big ask from a lot of developers. Uh, we've been able to move pretty quickly upon some requests. It's a Windows development environment primarily. Um, we are um, converting the MFG stuff over to QT right now. It's a big project. <laughs> we didn't realize how much work is going to be. We're like, oh, yeah, let's just convert that over. That was like a year ago. And so uh, a lot of it is already converted over to QT. So you, the, the goal is to make it available to be able to develop inside the Mac environment or the iOS environment um, and also make it more flexible. So uh, that's an ongoing process. I think we're, we're done with it by December, though. It's been a long road. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are you guys uh, going to stick with the uh, Scale 3D uh, solution? Yeah. No, we have our own now, yeah. Okay. So uh, Scale Form, um, CryEngine used to kind of require Scale Form, or it was kind of the, the 2D UI of choice. Um, Scaleform, I, I just met with them at Gamescom, and they tell me that version 5 is much improved from the previous version. Um, I haven't kicked the tires on it myself, but they say that's fine. And if you want to use a 2D uh, UI solution like Scaleform inside our IDE, you can. But we're also building our own, so it's more deeply embedded into what we're doing. So you don't need to use it. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? I just I went Bing, and I went above my 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 uh, my expertise level. <laughs> really, really. So what I'll do is uh, I'll get your card. I'll put you in touch with the tech. Okay. Sure. Hi. Yeah. 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 Yes. It can be. Yeah. There's some. Um, there's some uh, uh, legalities we have to be careful with, but yes, so it's a service we're offering. In fact, AWS already offers it to their development environment and their developers for AWS. And so um, we, on the commerce side, we recognize we don't have a very clear, clean answer yet. We just recognize we have a whole lot of pieces. In fact, I have a different slide I should have showed you. Because of Curse coming into the family with Twitch, we have a commerce capability and also with Twitch Prime to um, be able to service developers in a different way and basically target different audiences. That's the idea behind it. Um, yeah, any of our services. Yeah, that's a, a that's a one thing. We, we've done, I think, a pretty good job of letting everybody know that, you know, Lumberyard is there, and Lumberyard's great. Uh, we, we're banking on Lumberyard. We believe that at some point Lumberyard will be a technology in 2018, 2019, that if we as developers aren't thinking about how we're going to integrate compute and storage of the cloud, that we're going to be really behind our competitors. Um, and so uh, we think it's important. But the other three parts of our services – are equally as important and probably more readily available now. So um, I like to think of it as our end-to-end -end solutions, Lumbyard being one plank of that. Uh, it's not um, because they really focus in a different way. Um, they can. It's it's possible to stitch that in. Um, in fact. GameLift started from the App Store as a technology pipeline for them. So we have all kinds of threads into the App Store capability if we want to, but um, what, how they do it's a little bit different, so it takes some, some hand-holding. Sure. Yeah. All it does is it takes your your binary. There's really no asset integration. Yeah, just you take your binary, throw it in the cloud, and all the infrastructure and, and the back end's already done for you. Um, it's for session-based multiplayer games, so it doesn't work great for peer-to-peer. -peer. 
session-based multiplayer stuff here, utilizing the server, um, it's great. Yeah, oh, that says Lumberyard, yeah. It, it's, Lumberyard is um, really different. In fact, uh, the guys told me they're, they're calculating a stat ongoing. It's something like 43% of the code base is completely new from what we got two years ago. And what we kept are things that we thought worked pretty well. I mentioned we put a brand new networking layer in. We did a component system. Um, we're creating more modular approach so that workflows are more effective. Um, we're putting a brand new animation system in so you can import and export from my and 3D Studio Max more effectively. Um, we took the game SDK, which if you were making a first person shooter in the jungle before, it was awesome because you could get something up and running like in 15 minutes, it was amazing. But if you do any other kind of game, it was really hard to work with. So we took the game SDK out. We, we keep that available for you as a developer as a gem. So if you want to plug it back in, you can. But if you want to do a third person action game or if you want to do some other type of a product, RPG with libraries and all this stuff, we have a template in there. And we're continuing to build additional templates for certain types of genres for um, basically samples and little, little pieces for developers. A lot of improvements, a lot of stuff, yeah. For, just to be clear though, if, if you go to Azure and Google for your backend server stuff, then there's a deeper discussion we gotta have. <laughs> you know, so if you have your own server, if you're on-prem, awesome. If it's a single player game, awesome. Yeah, if you're local, no problem at all. But you know, what we, what we wanna be careful with, and we can work it out. There's a, you know, I tell my kids, there's always a solution. <laughs> But if you do want to take what we've built and apply that to Azure and or Google, um, then there's some other arrangements we have to make. Um, but if you're AWS, if you're an AWS customer, if you have an account for AWS, Lumberyard, you can take it right now and go, fly. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm not even thinking online. Uh, oh, hey, look, if you're not even thinking. We, we build, I'm an operator on interface integrity. Awesome. Built yeah. Absolutely, have at it. Have at it. Yep, yep. On-prem, single-player, no online co uh, capability or, or need, no problem. Sure. And it's pretty powerful for that stuff too. Any other questions? It's kind of quiet in the back. You guys are, you know, I was going to ask you to sit up closer, but I didn't do it. No, nothing. All right. Listen, thanks a lot for your time. Really appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Thank you.